books there uh, or look it up on your phone or however you want to read along. Uh, we're currently, uh, as you can see, uh, approaching the end of the Gospel of Matthew. I, I don't remember when we began, but it's been uh, probably a year that we've been just going through every verse of this and, and trying to mine out of it uh, the, the, the teaching that God wants us to have. It's been a great thing. Uh, just for those of you who are visiting, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, it, it sort of the, in its most basic function, is a proclamation of this Messiah King. That Jesus is not a man. He is indeed God, the God-man, come down to be our King and to rule over us. And that was his intention and purpose. And, uh, and there's just in many aspects of that just being repeated and, and expanded in the, in the Gospel of Matthew. And now we're coming to the end of our life because our king is, 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 uh, is greater than could be imagined. He's greater than any earthly king could be because in his coming... He's going to save the people from their sin. No king in the history of the world has ever done that. Oh, he might have been a good king. He might have been helpful to his own society. But only this king who has come down from heaven can save us from our sins. And that's, of course, part of the question then here that we're going to read in, in the first part of chapter 27 and we're going to interact with this idea of how bad is sin in this world. Uh, let's uh, read beginning at verse 1 and we'll read uh, to verse 10 this morning here of Matthew 27. This is God's holy inspired word. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him, and they led him away, and they delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. And when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said to him, What is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and he hanged himself. But the chief priest, taking the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury since it is blood money. So they took counsel and bought with, the <clears throat> bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. And then was fulfilled what has been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel. And they gave them for a potter's field, as the Lord directed. Will you pray with me and ask God's blessing upon our text this morning? Lord, how... Uh, we see these words before us, but we don't just want to read them. We want to understand them. We want them to be incorporated into our lives and hearts. We want them applied to us personally. We want to hear the voice of Jesus speak through them to us. <clears throat> and for we know that your word is formative, it's freeing, and it is stabilizing in our lives. And so give us that. For the sake of Jesus, amen. Well, let me begin by just a little note before we actually get into the text because some of you who may be familiar with the scriptures have looked at verse 9 and where it says that these words were spoke by the prophet Jeremiah and you're going, whoa, 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 whoa. I know the prophet Jeremiah. I've read it. Maybe sometimes you've read it several times, some of you. And I know that these words 
don't come from the prophet Jeremiah. Does that mean that there's a mistake here in the Bible when he says Jeremiah? Because you know if you're a Bible student, those words came from the prophet Zechariah. Okay, so how is it that Matthew says it's from Jeremiah when it actually from, is from Zechariah? Because we believe the Bible is true. And we believe there's no mistakes in the Bible. Well, let me just explain this to you. The Hebrew scriptures were made in scrolls. This was before the book days, you know. And so they rolled up this animal hide or this papyri into a long scroll and they unrolled it and they found the place where they wanted to read, okay? Not like our modern books. And there were three parts of the Hebrew scriptures. There was the law... And the, that was one scroll. There was the prophets. That was another scroll. And then there was a third scroll that they called the writings. Okay. Now, this particular quotation comes from the prophets. Okay. Well, you know what the first book in the prophets was? In that scroll? It was Jeremiah. So sometimes... They, in, instead of saying in the prophets, they said in Jeremiah, and they met the whole scroll here. So Matthew wasn't making a mistake in, in attributing it to the wrong prophet. He was simply giving you the bigger designation and saying, well, if you took Jeremiah, if you took the scroll of the prophets and you rolled it all out, you would find this quotation here. So contrary to people who criticize the Bible, it isn't true that there's a mistake here. It's that if there's a mistake in their understanding and in their refusal to accept the word is the problem with people like that. But I just thought, ah, you should know that. These are sort of little things that really just not directly impact the sermon here but are important to know because people bring them up from time to time. All right, that having just dealt with that one little thing out of the text now, let's go back to the main theme here. And the main theme, uh, <clears throat> as I'm looking through this, there's, there's three main actors in the text this morning. You have the Jewish leadership, you have Jesus, of course, who's there, and then you have Judas. So those are three main actors in the text, and, and I... I submit to you that one of the things that's being brought out is the consequences of sin. The desperately dire consequences of sin. You see, in modern society, first of all, many people don't even believe in sin anymore. They think of sin as just a psychological construction. Your grandma didn't like certain things, so she taught you not to like those certain things. And, 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 uh, <clears throat> there, but, but there's no real sin in the world. Now, of course, I don't believe that. All right? And, and you shouldn't believe that as well. Because it's the world, how we... How we conceive of the world around us will also determine how we live in the world and that and that people who do not anymore think that there is sin in the world will make all kinds of choices which as we'll see in the case of Judas just destroyed him destroyed his life completely so don't buy any modern psycholo psych psychological notion that it's, it's just self-made guilt. That's why you feel bad about things that you do in this world. No, we live in a world that was created and made by God. And because it's created and made by God himself, he sets the rules. This is a problem with modern society. When you think, for instance, that you are just monkeys that came out of the slime, 
then you, didn't, you don't have a creator. And therefore, there is no one above you to set the standard. And you essentially try to become your own God in this world. And you try to determine your own truth. And you try to, to uh, uh, make your own standards and, and, and uh, ways in this world. But that never works when that doesn't correspond with reality, beloved. You can say whatever you want. But when there is a reality that is above you that is different than that, you are doomed to failure if you choose to go your own way. And that's been the problem with humanity from the very beginning. God said to Adam, I've made you. I've placed you in this garden. You need to obey me. And, it, and all will be well with you. Adam said to God, essentially, he doesn't use these words, but his thoughts were this, I will be God. I will make my own decisions. I will go my own way. And because that happened, beloved, this world turned to a place of destruction and death and disaster S because sin has consequences there's a famous verse in the book of romans which says the wages of sin is death and that's what's been happening in the course of human history you've had the death of physical bodies You've had the death of relationships. You've had the, the death of society. You've had the death, that, and we could just multiply that out to the nth degree because that what is what marks us now. And it's exactly what we see happens to Judas here. He had every advantage before. I can't, you know, we can't imagine having had as much advantage as Judas. He walked with Jesus. So when the widow of Nain's son was raised from dead, he was there. When Lazarus was raised from the dead, he was there. When the, when the, the you know, when the crippled and the blind who couldn't see and their eyes were open. He was there. He heard the words of Jesus day after day after day. And yet he didn't believe it. His heart was somehow hardened to the truth that was right in front of them. And so we know the story. He, what does he do? He not only rejects Jesus' teaching, and Jesus' person, but he betrays him. And what does that do to his life? Well, he got a little money out of it. 30 pieces of silver, didn't he? But he also got untold grief and death. First, he, he can't he can't live with himself because as the scriptures told us here, he realizes that Jesus was an innocent man. Now, we don't know whether Jesus, wh whether uh, Judas had intended to betray Jesus to death, but he saw how the wind began to blow. That after he had betrayed Jesus, that the, the, the leaders decided to put him to death. And so he comes back to the, the leaders and he throws the money down there and says, look, this is an innocent man. I think what he's saying is you, you, you should change course. And they just look at him and say, what is that to us? See to your own problems, Judas. And beloved, let me tell you, that's where sin leads you to. At the end of the day, sin doesn't care about the consequences 
that come into your life. The devil doesn't care about the brokenness of, his, of your life. In fact, he probably rejoices. The more broken your life gets, the happier he is. If the devil can be happy, I don't, I don't know if he even has that in him. But that's what sin does. It breaks and breaks and breaks. Judas was broken off from the relationship that he had had with Jesus and the disciples. He was estranged from them. And then his so-called employers, the high priests who, who gave him money to betray Jesus, at the end of the day, they don't want him either. Hey, beloved, realize that in your own life too. That your sinful friends who drag you down the road to perdition with them will just as easy turn on you and throw you away. That's what sinners do to one another. There is no loyalty. And because of that, okay, he's, he's severed from, from Jesus. He's severed from, from his employers. He's, he's, he, he eventually enters this state where he's even severed from himself. He can't stand himself anymore. It says uh, here in the text there, uh, um, it's, it's, uh, in verse 3 it says, he changed his mind. And that's a, it's a Greek word. There's, that is, is uh, I'm not going to tell you what it is. You, you probably forget it anyway. But it, it's, it's uh, metomelo is what it is in Greek if you want to hear it. And what it means is, can mean repentance, but it, also, it means regret. It's not the normal word for repentance. That's metanoia in the Greek. And Matthew knew what he was doing when he writes that here in this text. He doesn't write the word, the common word for repentance, turning away from sin. He just writes the word for regret. And this is what sin will do to your life as well. Your life will eventually be full of regrets and remorse. Because it's destroying you bit by bit by bit and piece by piece by piece. And, and, and there, there's nothing left to be happy about. And you'll find yourself in a, an, in a place like Judas. Or you're just full of regrets. But regrets are not enough, beloved. Regrets just eat you up. There's a difference between a regret and repentance. In fact, Paul, uh, I have to find it in my notes here. It's in, uh, I think, 2 Corinthians 7. Uh, he, he, says, he says, Godly sorrow works repentance. But regrets only bring death. I'm giving you the paraphrase of that. I'll find it for you in, in a few minutes. And this is what we see. Sin is going to break you and crush you and maybe even bring you to the point where you're just full of fear and regrets and sorrow and bitterness on the inside. And it, 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 it's... Uh, you know, it's like you're just being picked apart piece by piece by piece. This is what transgression of the holy, uh, against the holy God does. It's the world we live in. It. Whether people want to acknowledge it or not, they will, it will happen to you if you continue down that path. And unfortunately, as we see here in the, in the life of, of Judas, his regrets were not enough. And, and it's interesting to see in the text there as we read about Judas. He doesn't turn to God in the midst of his remorse and regret. We don't find him going into the temple, falling on his face, confessing his sins and seeking mercy. We just see him letting the regrets and the and the and the and the tornness of his life just foment inside of him 
to the point of what? Destruction. Because what does the text tell us? He goes out and he hangs himself in his remorse and his regret. See, beloved, that's, that's a true picture of what sin does to a human being. If you let it have its reign in your life, this is where it will bring you. Oh, that doesn't mean everybody kills themselves at the end of the day. This is kind of the extreme expression of what it does in, in human beings' lives. But it will end in the same place, in death and separation. And now, for, in Judas's case, that's for all eternity. He has nothing left to live for in all the endless ages except his remorse, his regret, and his bitterness. It's an awful end, isn't it? And it's a very strong word, but it's a word that we need to hear. Because this is ultimately what it does to any human being at the end of the day. If they do not find true repentance, if they do not turn to their God, if they do not turn to the Lord Jesus for forgiveness, then this will be the ultimate end that happens in a human being's life. There's another little aspect of sin that I, I want to pick up out of, out of the leaders there, too, because they weren't without sin in this. You understand, just because I'm looking at Judas in more detail doesn't mean they were without sin. They were drivers of the whole situation. They were the ones who were accusing the innocent one, the holy one, and going to hand him over to the Romans. And then later on, when they stand in front of, uh, of Pilate, they say a most interesting thing. Um, they said, uh, i got to find it here. Just give me a second. Uh, verse 25 of the same chapter. Go, go down there, it says, And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Now we'll, we'll talk about this in more detail when we get to this trial before Pilate. But, but sin is condemning even to the generations if you let it go in your life. That's a scary, scary thing. But we know it's true. Beloved, you see it around you all the time. That if, if a, a parent and if parents are wicked and, and following their own desires and their own authorities and not following God, what does it do to the children? What does it do to the grandchildren? We have a, an intimation of that way back in Exodus chapter 20 where God says, uh, says that he, he, those who hate him are condemned, are, are, are cursed to the third generation. So it's not even, sin is such a devastating thing that is not only devastating to you, but can be devastating unless God is merciful, can be devastating even to the generations following you. This is how poisonous and potent and dangerous that sin is. It's not to be taken lightly then. Well, how do we deal with it? Well, we deal with it by the third person who's in this chapter, the Lord Jesus Christ. What is he doing here as he stands silently before his accusers? And then silently before Pilate, except for uh, one or two statements, and then he goes to the cross. 
He's dealing with sin. He's doing what we can't do. We're completely overcome by the sin of our lives. And we can't fight our way out of it. And the truth is, is that, that, that we don't even feel like we want to. But Jesus comes and he steps between us and our sin. And when he hangs there on the cross and his life's blood is poured out, he's paying that price of death. The wages of sin is death. He's paying that price right there on the cross so that you might be freed from your sin. An amen out of that one, beloved. A little hallelujah for that. That's our only hope. See? It would have been Judas' hope, but he didn't take it. He chose to shrink down in his remorse and and his sadness and his separation instead of turning to the living God, our Lord Jesus Christ, where there's always mercy to be found. So what's the answer to sin? This devastating scourge upon us? The answer is in a man, the God-man, our king that we've been learning about in Matthew here, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he's going to have the victory over sin. What we could never be victorious over, he on the cross is absolutely and 100% victorious over, over it. And we'll know that because he'll be raised from the dead in three days later. And then he says to us, as he had said earlier in Matthew Come to me, all ye that are heavy laden and burdened, and I will give you rest. It's not in your remorse and your regrets, but it's in your coming to Jesus that all will be made well. And the victory that he has had will become your victory as well. So though sin is horrible, and we see it in this chapter very clearly, yet there is one who is greater. The old hymn says, grace that is greater than all my sin. Marvelous grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus. Now let's think of applying this just, just a little bit. We've kind of been applying it as we go along here. But let's not miss the point here. Because now we've been talking generally, but I want to talk to you personally as well. See, it's not enough to acknowledge that there are sins in the world. That's pretty easy to, to uh, as we say, um, to establish and prove. But you need to look at yourself now this morning and say to yourself, what about my sins? Have I come in humble, true repentance, not regret, but repentance, turning away from them and turning to Jesus? Is that my lot now? Is that where I'm at? That's what the Bible means when it says you are saved. We use that term, we throw it around. What does it mean? Well, it means we're taken, our sins are taken away from us and we are made new in Jesus. But that has to be a personal thing. It's not just what the church believes. It has to be what I believe as a person. That God opens my heart to that. And that's what I want as well. And then all is well. Let's pray. Thank you, Father in heaven, for uh, speaking to us again from the scriptures this morning.
in a very sad passage. But sad passages are filled with hope when we use them to point us back to Jesus. And that's where we come, Lord. Amen. <clears throat> well, let's sing one side.